pastor here, and I'm very glad to be uh, preaching this morning. Actually, I'm going to be real, real, real. I was not that glad to be preaching at 9 a.m. Because this this sermon was uh, put me on the struggle bus. Okay, like sometimes I like look at the word and it just comes to me. Like right, like the Holy Spirit comes and I'm like mm, I know the word I have for the people. And but this time it was literally like just throwing myself against the wall. I like looked at the scripture and I was like Ugh, nothing, Ugh, nothing. I literally thought about texting Brother Wayne because he's preaching at 11 and be like I'm gonna need you to take both services. I got nothing here. But I would pray and the Lord was like no you're going to preach. And then I was like, okay, but I'm not, I'm not getting this. I'm not getting any. I was like, Ugh, I just, there's no unction with this word, Lord. I was like, maybe I'll go find like an old sermon I preached a while ago. And the Lord was like, no, you're going to preach the lectionary. And I was like, then you gonna need to tell me what to say. <laughs> and uh, we just we just had this back and forth. And then finally, like, um, it, it just, I felt like it was like, I can't, you know, just hold it. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden I was Kool-Aid man and I was on the other side of the wall and then the Lord gave me a word. So I feel glad, but I just want you to say it wasn't, it wasn't cute getting here. It wasn't cute. Also, I just want to acknowledge our online family because actually I met this brother here and he has been a part of our online family in Detroit. And so he's here in person with us for a few weeks, but he was just testifying about how he worships with us online every week. And I just felt like, all right, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, just didn't want to take that for granted. I felt like you helped. Woo! Mm, yes, spirit. Thank you. Um, you know, it just renewed my energy for remembering that there are folks worshiping with us. And because you're right, it feels like invisible community out there. But to realize that it's God's really working through that ministry. So I felt really grateful for His word of encouragement. And for any of you uh, who are aware, it was Chinese New Year on Saturday. So Happy New Year to any folks who were observing the Chinese New Year. Man, I felt like I was like. How come nobody invited me over to their house for a big giant banquet, which is usually what you get to eat on Chinese New Year? I felt sad inside. I don't know. I'm just sad I all the Chinese American friends in my life. So, um, so the scripture in the lectionary that the Lord wouldn't let me leave alone is actually part, it's, it's one that I think is really familiar to us. It's very, very foundational. It's one that people use all the time to talk about the beginning of following Jesus. Um, but I felt like God helped me just sit on it and riff on it a little bit. So Matthew 4, 17 through 23 says, From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and, An and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. Now I'm going to make you do a little bit of personal, little interaction with each other for a minute before I jump into this. I want you to answer two questions with your neighbor. You're going to make a friend, introduce yourself to somebody new. What are two things you're really passionate about? All right, just two things you're passionate about. And also, if a, your good friend were to describe you to other people, what's two things that they would say you really love to do? All right, so what are two things you're passionate about that you would just say, I'm passionate about these two things? And then um, if a friend were to describe you to someone else, what do you think they would say you really love to do? All right, so turn and tell them, all right? Two things you're passionate about, two things your friends would say that you love to do. Did both people share? Make sure both people have shared. Find a friend. Tell somebody. <laughs> All 
All right, I'm going to bring us back together. I want you to think about these things or have these things in your mind. Because I think when we look at this passage and we're like, Jesus came along and he called, the, he called Peter and Andrew and they left their nets. For many of us, leaving a life of fishing would not be terribly costly. So we'd be like, yeah, for sure. I also would leave my nets. But we have to think about what fishing and what the nets were in their lives, right? And then think about what is the parallel for us. We can't just be like, yeah, that would be easy for me. Because what's interesting when you look at Matthew, uh, when you look at the book and the description is, we only know like two things about Peter and Andrew. They're casting nets in the sea for they were fishermen. Immediately, they left their nets. So what they're trying to tell us is that when Jesus comes along, they leave the one thing that is really identifiable about them. And then we go on to these next two dudes and we learn really two things about them. James, son of Zebedee and his brother, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending nets, he called them. What do they leave? The boat and their father. We know two things about them. And when Jesus comes along, those are the two things that they leave. So fall right here, we get in this snapshot that when Jesus comes along, the beginning of the journey starts with leaving behind, in some ways, the two or three things that you are most known for. And what's interesting to me is it's not a bad thing they're doing. It's not like they were selling opioids in the college dorms and Jesus came along and told them to stop. That's not what's happening. They're doing a good thing, their livelihood. They're doing what they've been raised up to do. But this is actually, it says at that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is what repentance looks like. See, we always think repentance is moving away from a bad thing. But repentance is actually just going in a different direction. It might be moving from a thing that's just fine. It's just not a thing that is where Jesus is taking you. So there's nothing sinful about being a fisherman, but it's not where Jesus is taking them. So repentance isn't just stop selling opioids in the dorms. Who amongst you must repent of them? <laughs> All right? It's not just stop embezzling funds at work. Eh? It's not just stop talking trash about your coworkers. Eh? Eh. <laughs> it's stop doing whatever is keeping you from following Jesus. And we have to think about following. Again, this is like a simple word, right? Discipleship, being a student, following. We have to think about what that is. If, you ever, if you're a driver, think about when you follow someone in the car. There are good followers and there are bad followers, right? A good follower knows the right amount of distance, right? And when you change lanes, they change lanes, right? And when you slow down, they slow down. A bad follower, though, is that person who keeps too much distance. And they let cars get in between you and them. And you're looking in your rearview mirror and you're like, why is this person letting, like, this semi-truck come between? They're not going to see me changing lanes. Like, don't they see me? I'm going to exit over here. You change lanes. They don't change lanes. And then you're going to exit. And then now you're like, do I pull over and wait for them at the off-ramp? And you feel upset because you're the one who knows where you're going. And the follower needs to stay close enough to go. So... Some, when we follow Jesus, Jesus is going to say, some of the things that you are most known for, I need you to get up and get leave that stuff. You know, and we're over here just like, man, but fishing's not like a sin. Fishing's not a problem. Fishing actually pretty sustainable, Lord. It's eco-friendly, right? And he's like, but is it where I'm going? If you want to consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you have to follow Jesus. And the first thing that happens is he's like, the thing, thank you so much, I'm all like, uh, 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 because I sang so hard during worship, so I just, <laughs> thank you very much. I was like, help me, sister. So um, I think that we need to stop making the definition so narrow and expand it. So then I want you to think about the things that you named, about what you're passionate about, or what your friends might say that you are passionate about or good at. And what would have to be true of Jesus for him to come along and say, hey, follow me? And it means leaving that. We're like, ooh, I don't want to leave stuff I like. But what would have to be true of Jesus for you to, the description here is, 
do that immediately. Right? The only reason I would do that immediately is if I just knew Jesus is better. You don't mind leaving a good thing for a better thing. Right? We don't mind leaving a good You'd be like, oh, you want me to give up my Ford Taurus for this amazing giant? I really don't even know what a good car is because I'm not into cars. What's an amazing car? Like, Range Rover, great. Or whatever car is like your dream car. Like a giant, beautiful, amazing car that's like 2020. Like the Lord was like, leave behind 1998. You know, car that's breaking down. For 2020 car, would you be like, oh no, that's like really tough. No, it's not hard to leave functional for better. So, but I think because we don't see that Jesus is, following Jesus is going to be more life-giving than even other good things. So we hem and haw over here. I also think, even though we know, we literally know the sentence, follow Jesus is a part of being a Christian, mostly we want Jesus to come where we are. <laughs> We'd be like, come where I am. I am here, bless here. And he's like, that is interesting. I am over here. <laughs> and, you, and you were like, but this is not selling opioids. And he is like, but I am over here. And this, my friends, is lordship. Lordship, Lordship, Lordship. So that's the first snapshot that we see. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven being Jesus walking right up to the boat and saying, come with me. But we get this intuitively. They have to drop their net to follow Jesus. Because sometimes we're like, okay, Jesus, yeah, I'll follow you, but let me just bring this with me. Now, this isn't a fishing pole that you can, like, throw over your shoulder and be cute. These nets are giant. And can you just imagine them being like, I don't know when I'm going to need this net again. Just picking up this giant thing, twirling it around, two brothers carrying this heavy net, and like, we're coming. We're coming. We're following you. You not only have to leave the boat, you have to leave all the tools, all the things you know how to use, all your competencies. You have to leave that behind. So that's our first snapshot of following. So I tried to think about, like, well, what does this look for us? Look like for us now? Because not everybody, everyone's like, I wish the Lord would tell me to quit my job. Um, <laughs> I wish following him meant like I could just be like, goodbye, the Lord told me not to come to work today. <laughs> but for those of us who continue to have bills and need to live this East Bay life, <laughs> What does it mean, though, to be at your work? There's, there's multiple ways we can be in spaces we have to be in. Some of you, there might be a call. Some of you, there might be an invitation, like leave your current form of employment towards something else. But, but that's not true for all of us. And so how might you be in your workplace and heed this call? Can we think about that for a second? Because there's a couple, I usually feel like we only bring the Lord into the workplace under a couple of circumstances. When our boss is making our life terrible, <laughs> then we'd be seeking God all the time. <laughs> Um, and when we sense that someone, our unemployment might be coming us soon, and then we be seeking the Lord. But when it's going fine, we don't really talk to Jesus at work. Do you know what I'm saying? Right? Is that not basically true? But what if we were to, in our workplace, say, what's it look like to follow you right now? Show me. All right, if quitting's not the option, if quitting's not, what's it mean then for me to come into work and not do it where I'm, I'm doing it in the way the world teaches me to do it, but one where I'm really actually listening to where you're leading me? In the smallest ways, it might mean actually being kind to the person at your workplace that everyone else treats a little bit like trash. Do you know what I'm talking about? There was, um, there was a, a, a person I, a, a, on the internet, which is always fills me with joy. Um, but I did read a story about a person who was talking about being in their workplace and there was somebody who w just struggled some with like some social norms, right? And they were awkward. And you know how easy it is. Someone's just like a little bit different or a little bit awkward and they're ostracized in the workplace. And they were just talking about how they made a decision to just try to be kind to this person. And how after not very long, the person one day just gave them a note which basically said, thank you for treating me like a person. And I honestly think that's what it looks like to follow Jesus in the workplace, yeah. instead of just following the lead of dehumanizing folks. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's, I saw a post actually from a student I knew who was a, a part of an intervarsity group um, in Portland and sh they became a flight attendant and they posted something and I was like, you know what, this is a great snapshot of someone being at work and figuring out how they can follow Jesus in the midst of it. So this, um, they said, uh, this is their Facebook post. 
What, is exact, what exactly does it mean to be intentional flight attendant? It means turning off the radi car radio on my way to work to pray over the day. The act is especially important when I don't want to go to the airport. It aligns my heart with God's and reminds me of the kind of person I strive to be. And then I actually put it in a slide. This is the thing she says she prays for. One, the mechanical soundness of the airplane. Two, that the crew remembers to communicate well and seek to be the best team possible. Three, the medical equipment, that it works properly. Four, over any medical emergencies. Five, over any sort of emergencies that we would be calm, cool, collected, and do what we were trained to do. For my passengers, for their health and well-being, that they'll be, feel safe in my care. And that if anyone needs a little bit of extra love today, that God would help me seed them. To find joy in the mundane, that my work, however dull it may seem, whether I'm gathering garbage or pouring a Diet Coke, would be done to the best of my abilities, that I wouldn't half anything, that my work would be an act of worship. And lastly, I pray to be the kind of person who can be interrupted, whether that's a passenger needing comfort in the midst of a panic attack or a flight attendant who needs to vent on the jump seat. That truly makes a difference in my day and how I respond, not react to people. Wow. Amen. Amen. I think that is a picture of somebody who in the midst, like, I think we have all experienced flight attendants who are not praying that prayer every day. <laughs> I, I call it break my spirit airlines. <laughs> every time I'm like, oh, you are breaking my spirit. But what I love, though, is the person might be showing up and doing the same thing. But there's a difference when you say, Jesus, I'm following you. I'm following you in my attitude, in my posture, and how I see people in this space. Amen? Amen. Um, I just, and I've shared this story with you before, but this, uh, it's because as I was thinking about it again, as I was, uh, is my best experience of this, my best experience of somebody paying attention to Jesus at the workplace is when I, um, I got super sick after I was preaching in Boston for a conference during like the worst cold spell ever, but I'm an American studies major, so I wanted to do like the historical walk through Boston, so I didn't like sub-zero temperature. Like, I don't, it was the wrong choice. Anyway, when I got home, I was sick, 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 sick. And I was single, 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 and no one would pick up my medicine for me. So, and this is a real struggle that we need to talk about in terms of being community. So I went to CVS to pick up my medicine, and I was so sick, I basically half passed out, half laid down in the store, just on the floor. And they like pulled me into the staff break room where I just had to lay down because I was so sick. And as I'm laying there, out of nowhere, I just feel these hands on my shoulders and someone just starts praying for me in tongues. Aww. Someone just starts praying over me in tongues in the CVS break room. And then just starts praying for my healing and just starts praying for me to feel better. And I mean, my face is down, so I don't even know who it is. They didn't like ask for a prayer. And they're just praying and praying. Pray and literally about four minutes later, I stood up. And I was like, I felt better. And this woman is a teller at CVS and saw me sick and followed Jesus and came into the break room and literally prayed healing over me. And I experienced healing in CVS. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I just, that is an example of somebody who, wherever they are, is saying, Jesus, What's it look like to follow you right now? Yeah. Because everything about the culture and how the world tells you to do it is just, you know, keep doing your job. You don't need to worry about people. But she turned being a teller at CVS into being a minister of healing and the gospel. Amen? And that is some of what we are invited to do here. Amen? So then as I was sitting on this, I just started thinking about like, but wait, when they leave the boat, that's not the last time they're ever in a boat, right? So I just, I got really fixated on this, like when do we see boats again in Matthew? Matthew eight. So can we look at another snapshot of this interaction of them around a boat? So Matthew eight, when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. A scribe then approached and said, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. Here we are again on the topic of following, right? Just like before on the topic of following. Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. So this is like an eager person, like Jesus, you're so awesome, you're such a great leader, make me one of your mentees, let's do this. And Jesus' answer is foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. 
The guy's like, I'll follow you anywhere. And he's like, really? Because I don't even have a house or a place to stay. Birds, foxes, they have a place to, if you want to follow me, we're joining like the community of the houseless because that's how unstable and ambiguous my life is. Are you really game to follow me? Mm. Jesus is not just desperate for followers, but he's raising the bar on what it means to follow him. And then another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Meaning not just like literally his father had passed away, but meaning like let me fulfill my obligation as like a son until my father passes away and then I will come and follow you. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Meaning, it's now. The bar is higher than you think, and you need to follow me now. Versus like, I'll start following you after finals is over. I'll start following you when child support is coming in regularly. I'll start following you when my marriage is in a better place, right? That's why what, he's, what he's saying here is like, I'll start following you when stuff in my life and family is in order. And Jesus is like, if you want to follow me, we do it now. That's tough. I was like, you're not going to get a lot of people following you. And Jesus is like, uh, he's bringing deeper and deeper clarity into what followership means. Jesus said, follow me, let the dead bury their own. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. They're back in the boat. And a windstorm arose on the sea, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. Which There's all these memes going around that are like, even in the midst of a storm, Jesus was asleep, so it just means that no matter what's going on, you can take a nap. And I was like, there's this whole thing online called nap ministry, and I'm kind of here for it. <laughs> I'm very here for it. And I think this is one of their founding scriptures. <laughs> and they went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. And then he said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? And then he got up and rebuked the wind and sea, and there was a dead calm. And they were amazed, saying, what sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? Now, I think, again, it's easy to be like, I would have known, like, if I was in the boat with Jesus, it was, like, not a problem. No, saints. Look, have you ever been in a boat? This is not a cruise ship, saints. Okay, this is not a cruise ship in the rain. This is a boat in a storm. This is also not the era of like, everyone grew up with swim lessons. This is like, the sea is a dangerous place, right? This is not like, ooh, everyone knows the world is round. This is like, who knows where we all gonna disappear to off the edge of this water. The water is dangerous. The water is unknown. The water is scary. And now it is coming over the sides of not your cruise ship, but of your little boat. And I want you to imagine, like, we just, we can't, we dismiss the disciples. Like, mm, why didn't they just know? I want you to imagine that like, you're, that you're in your car and the brakes go out and you see yourself heading on a collision with another car, would you calmly be like, I know Jesus is in the car with me, so I do not fear the collision that is coming. My no, you would be like, ah! right? that's what's going, panic, all right, panic. And that's what is even more amazing to me that Jesus is like, <laughs> just out. Out, 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 out. But this is real panic, and they are afraid for their lives. And then they wake Jesus up, and they're like, don't you care? And I, I get, he's like, why are you afraid? I'm like, because logic, Jesus, because I don't want to die today. That's why I'm afraid. Like, that's how I feel when Jesus asks this question. I'm not all like, oh, I don't know. I was just journaling about my fear. He goes, why are you afraid? <laughs> then he got up, but this is so deep to me, and he looks out at creation. He looks out at creation. And he goes, stop that. He just looks at the wind and he looks at the sea. And he says, quit it. And creation remembers the voice of the one who made it. Are you the one that spoke me into existence? I recognize you. And it literally obeys. And the sea goes from like almost drowning this boat to just, it says like a dead calm. That's, to me, that it, there's a whole theology of how we relate to creation inside of there, right? Creation isn't just this thing to be exploited and consumed, but it's something that recognizes the voice of its own creator. I really think if we, I really think indigenous folks have so much to teach us when they're like, creation is our relative. Right? And you look all through scripture and it's like, creation's going to worship God. Creation reflects God. But we're over here like, creation, let's destroy it. But when Jesus looks at creation, he's like, you're one of my created beings, and when I talk to you, it listens. And then they look at him, and they're like, who are you? 
because they didn't know he was that level. Because back when they dropped their nets, they knew something about him. They knew enough to drop their nets and leave the boat, but they didn't know this about him. I think it's so interesting that he brings them back to the boat where they made a first decision to leave that stuff behind, but now everything is so different. They've seen him heal, they've seen miracles, they've seen him teach, and now he brings them back to the very place they first left and says, let me expand your understanding of who I am because I'm also expanding your understanding of what it means to follow me. So he always gives greater revelation, but then also gives a deeper invitation, right? Greater revelation. I can speak to creation. I have that level of authority. I'm not just a rabbi. I'm more than that. But also following me is more radical than you originally thought. Amen? So they're back in the boat, and he expands his understanding. Following is costly, but when he asks more of us, he shows himself, shows more of himself to us. I think that we think that uh, we often have this narrative that like your, dis- your er- first decision point, right? Like becoming a Christian is like the big and challenging decision. And then after that, you're just like a disciple. But if we look at this journey, we actually see maybe the first decision was the easiest one. Because in the boat with the storm and all this supernatural stuff, there's so much more fear. It's so much more chaos. That maybe following Jesus actually isn't about it gets easier, but actually we have to go deeper and deeper with facing our fears. So let's look at the third time they're in a boat. Can we do it? And I'm going to make you talk to each other about how this third time is different and similar to this scene that we just saw. So now we're in Matthew 14, the last snapshot. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, and the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart. It's I. Don't be afraid. It's just me walking on the water. It's not a big deal. What's a big deal? Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So how is this snapshot similar and different from the one where Jesus was asleep in the boat? I actually want you to talk to each other, all right? So how is it similar and different from the second time? Go. Bible scholars, what do you got for me? What do you see that's similar and different? I actually want to hear from a few of you. What's similar? What's different? Fear and faith show up in both of them, right? That theme of fear and faith. And I think I, that encourages me because I think sometimes we think that having faith means we're not experiencing fear. And that's not it at all. It's the choice in the midst of fear. It doesn't take faith if you're not afraid. That's just called watching Netflix, right? (laughs) When in the midst of a challenging situation, we choose to trust, that's faith. What else do you see that's similar or different? Similar in that you show in both times what he can do and who he is. That's right. And the first time they saw it, and the second time they still saw it, but they doubted. 
Right, so it's interesting, right? Each time there's more of a revealing about who Jesus is. He's in the boat and rebukes creation. Now he's walking on water, right? So he keeps revealing who he is, but then there is these fear responses. Yeah, what else do you see? Is it similar or different? Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. Like, they're having this supernatural interaction, and then all of a sudden it's like, but also, uh, these are big waves. <laughs> and so I should not be out here. And fear takes over. Yes, that's right. I love that. You can see that they're having like a supernatural moment, and then they're coming right back into this. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I get it. It makes sense. But there's Jesus trying to press them out of that. Good. Anything else you see that's similar or different? Yes? That's right. That's right. So three times at the boat. The first time he comes to them and says, follow me. The second time he's in the boat with them, showing them more of who he is. And the third time they're in the boat out at sea alone, and they have, Peter gets out of the boat and comes to him. Such an interesting evolution, right? I just love this, this ongoing journey. Again, what I love about it is following Jesus isn't just a one-moment decision, but it's this ongoing transformation, evolution, engagement, seeing more of him, revealing more of yourself, seeing more of him, taking another step of faith. What was a step of faith before is not a step of faith now. Stepping out of the boat onto dry land and following Jesus, that was a courageous decision in Matthew 4. But now stepping out of the boat onto water is the courageous decision. So what was faithful when you made your decision in eighth grade? That was a courageous decision. But saints, that's not your courageous decision today. That's not your courageous decision today because you know more and you've seen more. So now you've got to step somewhere new. If you're just like, I'm going to keep dropping my nets and stepping onto dry land, the Lord be like, but I'm out here on the water now. Because he keeps trying to take us someplace new. Take us somewhere new. And so I was thinking about this, right? So he's revealing himself again. Y'all see, look at this biblical exegesis. Bible scholars in the room. That's why we've got to do Bible study together. <laughs> Even if you've been following Jesus for a while, it doesn't mean that fear disappears. We continue to have to face fear at a deeper and deeper level. What was faithful at one point is not necessarily faithful at another point in our journey. We have to keep trusting and evolving. And what, what I don't like about this story is apparently there is often storms present for us to learn more about who Jesus is and for us to take a deeper level of faith. I was like, why are they in the boat in a storm every time you're next leveling them? Like, I don't like that, but I know that that's true in my own experience, that it is in the midst of the difficult times and the things that are struggling and the things where it feels like, I don't know how I'm going to make my way out of this, that that's where Jesus shows up and shows you more of who he is. If there's no storm, there's no Jesus showing you that he can rebuke the storm. If there's no being lost in the middle of the sea, there's no Jesus walking out to you in the middle of the sea. We don't want it to be that way, but it is. But also it can be reassuring because we know that doesn't mean that something's wrong, right? Because when storms are happening, we feel like, I thought you said you was we smoothing, right? Faithfulness would lead to flat waters. And that's not necessarily true. He doesn't promise no storms. He promised to show up in the storm. I wish he was a no storm Jesus, but he's actually a in the storm Jesus. Maybe there's a different religion if you need a no storm religion, but I can, he can, he's not, this is not Christianity. But he shows up, and he meets you in it, and he transforms it. So then when I was like, all right, Lord, why did you, why would you not release the, I was like, what's, how am I supposed to, how, where am I going with this? And I felt like the Lord was like, I want you to share your very current example of how you've been experiencing this. And I was like, current? But what about a story from four years ago? And the Lord was like, no, get out the boat. And so I was like, okay. So <laughs> I was like, you don't know me. Um, so where I've been experiencing this is, for example, for me, when I first started doing ministry, giving a sermon was an unbelievable challenge and risk. I mean, it was like 
12 hours a day, working on all day long, right? Like every day, preaching it. It was crazy. And it was funny because I actually, went, my very first sermon I ever gave uh, my senior year of college was off the Dropping the Nets passage. So I was thinking about that. But now giving a sermon is not the hard thing. It's, it was this week, but not in the same way that it was. Um, one, the thing that's been difficult was starting about an, a, a, three or four years ago, um, honestly, starting in like 2013 when stuff happened with Trayvon Martin, I was in the middle of leading an urban program for about 80 students, and the non-indictment came through, and I was trying to talk about it with this group of like 80 college students who were all, we were all like, you know, working at different nonprofits and different churches, talking about God's heart for justice. But I couldn't put words to it, but I knew that how I was talking about it wasn't quite right, like it wasn't enough. And what I didn't know how to articulate then was I had come to the end of what basically a white-centered version of biblical justice could do to engage the topic, right? I, I, didn't, I couldn't put words to it then, but one of my student, one of my BCM students, I was like, uh, we're talking about the program I was doing and I, in my mind I was like, oh, it's all, for people of different races, and we're all doing this justice -y thing. And she just turned to me once, and she just was like, no, this space is not for black people. Oh. And um, she, put to like, she put to words what I couldn't face, which was even when I was trying to do justice, I didn't know how to fully do it justly. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning. And in 2014, when stuff went down in Ferguson, and I saw how so many Christians not only were silent, but were hostile towards black folks. Now I know not like anti-blackness is not like new to black folks, but honestly, it, it was new to me the depth to which it was in Christianity. Like I thought that, particularly, I was like, okay, there's like this pocket, but I thought like this pocket would be like, Yes, let's get behind the activists. Like this, like this crazy militarization of the police, the way activists are being treated, the way black folks are being talked about. Like we're gonna speak up and say, like this is wrong. Did they? No. And then, I don't know if y'all remember fall 2014, video after video after video, trauma after trauma after trauma. And by that point, I was on the phone almost every day with friends and staff, um, around the country, black staff in, in our movement who were, we were in agony and in so much trauma, but no one around us was addressing it. And that was the, be it was like I could feel like this whole faith tradition that had housed me and raised me was crumbling. And I had just started my master's program with all these Native American folks and all this history. I knew things were bad with Native folks, but then when you spend a year just delving into exactly what like, residential schools were, and like l just the level of murder and genocide that was done in the name of Jesus. I mean, literally, I had to take like mental health breaks just reading history books. And I was like, I don't have my, my understanding of justice. I know Jesus cares about justice, but somehow what I know about it is not enough. And it was just crumbling. And going to church started to be traumatizing because they wouldn't say anything. We'd literally be on the phone crying all week long and then go to church and it was like making it worse. And I was like, I don't know how to follow Jesus. And it was such a, you know when you come to your faith to be something secure and it just is falling apart? That was 2014, 2015. I'm gonna be honest with you, I just quit going to church for a while. That's why sometimes folks, I'm here at the way and folks will be like, sorry, Pastor Ern, I wasn't at church. I was like, I will never judge you. <laughs> because I couldn't go to church. It wasn't that I stopped following Jesus. I just couldn't go to church because it was making it harder to trust the Lord. So when I was in Portland for a seat, I just took, I was tr fi I just trying to find my way. But it was such a honestly discouraging and demoralizing time. And then it, we were heading towards, I was leading worship at this conference that was happening in St. Louis. And it was like, we're gonna talk about Black Lives Matter. Because we're in St. Louis in 2015 at a Christian conference. And behind the scenes, everyone I worked with was like, no, we're not gonna talk about it. You're not gonna talk about it. And I was like, no, it seems pretty obvious, like we should. And they're like, no, it's a global missions conference. We're not gonna talk about domestic issues. And I was like, why? Because our domestic racism never impacted our global missions. Like we never exported our racism. Like, 
right? You know, where people would be like, well, we don't want to make people uncomfortable. I was like, black people not uncomfortable with this topic. I was like, who, who, who are you worried about making uncomfortable? <laughs> Right? And, but then it got, you know, I would meet with leaders that were like much higher above me and I would essentially be told I was being too emotional. As it began to take a lot of, I was like, and it was so shocking to me. And my mental health took a turn. This, I'm just describing what 2014 and 2015 was like. In the end, we ended up talking about it at the conference, amen? But behind the scenes, it was the beginning of many of us essentially getting pushed out, blackballed out of the organization. Um, seeing, uh, as we continued, even on the other side of the conference, to say, like, we need to address this topic. So then I was at a gathering of Asian American folks, and I was like, look, a huge portion of the folks who work for our organization, our black staff, are underfunded, and they're super traumatized. And, like, we're over here at a gathering of Asian Americans like, hey, Things are fine. I was like, we, this, this is not working for me. This, this isn't working, like, can we need to talk about this? Because this weird way we're siloed from each other is actually like keeping white supremacy in place. Like, we can't do this. And I just, I got chewed out in the lobby of a hotel and told if I didn't like it, I could quit. And it was, I don't, it's, it's, it's hard to explain explain how demoralizing and discouraging it was, right? At the same time, at, pretty soon afterwards, uh, I had been for about two years with an amazing group of women. We had been putting on a conference for women of color, and then at the top of uh, January, right after Trump was elected, we got together to plan our next one, and the whole planning thing fell apart because basically, particularly the black women on the planning team were like, I can no longer do anything that is even vaguely connected to evangelicalism. I'm so deeply betrayed, I'm so deeply hurt, I've labored in these spaces for so long, and to see how evangelicals have handled this time, and literally this, like, this group of women that had been like a life raft for me in the midst of all this trauma, we've just disintegrated. So here, and that's what those years felt like. I'm not gonna leave us in this land of discouragement. I'm just trying, but I'm just trying to be real about how that was the storm. That was the storm for me. That was the storm of 2014, 15, 16. And that is, in, in the end though, that storm is what made me start looking for a job elsewhere. And that storm is what made me find a job at the way. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Because here, we actually talk about those things. And that storm is what made me start looking for other authors and other theologies. Yeah. That storm is what made me find James Cone. Mm -hmm. That storm is what helped me find Dolores Williams. Yeah. That storm is what helped me find Renita Weens. That storm is what helped me find um, Ada Maria Isasi Diaz. Yeah. That storm is what helped me um, finish my program and write a paper on trusting theologies of justice from the margins. Basically, a paper I could not have written in 2014 when that young woman was like, this program is not for black folks. Literally, that, pr that word was a prophetic gift to, to me. Because I, I wrote a paper several years later that I couldn't, would not even know existed at, when she spoke that to me. But it was a paper on basically centering black liberation and indigenous theologies in our approaches to justice instead of white-based social justice models. I could not have done that. I could not have done that. Um, and then uh, in the middle of last year, I posted to Facebook because I was missing this woman of color community. Like, oh, I just dream of like creating a woman of color community where we can come together. And uh, uh, basically what I, I like to say is, you know, any woman of color over 30, um, you've moved up in leadership and basically you're managing up you're managing your white supervisor. You've been put on every diversity committee at your job place. Every time there's a racial crisis, they call you in to deal with it. Every person of color under you wants to be mentored. Um, and all of that, in addition to whatever job you're actually being paid to do. And now you've become the secret keeper of your organization because you have to protect everybody's reputation. And there is no place where you can come and just talk about how these things are impacting you. 
without protecting somebody else's reputation. And I was like, I want to create a community where women of color can come and you don't have to edit yourself at all. Because the space is for you, for your healing. And so uh, I launched this space called Liberated Together. And we launched a cohort for women of color over 30. And its sole purpose is you can talk how you need to, and no one will ever judge you. You will never have to explain your fatigue, your frustration, your anger. And we're going to do some real talk across, across these lines. We're going to do real talk because Asian American women and black women do not naturally have solidarity. Indigenous women and Latino do not naturally have solidarity. So we're going to do real learning about each other's community so we can have real women of color solidarity. I could not have started that space in 2014. Do you know what I'm saying? I could not have started that space. And so the storm and the trauma and the deconstructing and the disillusionment and the despair of all these last few years pressed me to go someplace new where now I'm able to follow Jesus and create a space for people I literally could not have imagined just five or six years ago. I did not want the storm. I did not want it, but I did see more of Jesus. And then, this is the thing, so I was like, and then walking off the water, so I launched this thing, it felt so organic, I stepped out of the boat, I really, I stepped out of the boat, I was like, Jesus, we're doing it, space for women of color, I made a website, I was like, the cohort's <laughs> happening, like, I, and then literally, I launched it, and then I started to see the waves. Do you know what I'm like, I didn't think about it, when I got out, I was like, oh, yes, it's happening, everything's happening, thank you, God. And then someone came up to me and was like, oh, that's so courageous for you to put that out there. And I was like, what? And they were like, well, yeah, because you just don't know. Like, are people going to want to do it or not? And I was literally, it was like, wave. Do you know what I'm saying, right? Like, they spoke an insecurity into my mind. Okay. And I was like, oh, I wasn't feeling afraid before, but I guess I am now. And then this young biracial woman came up to me, and she was like, oh, I think, she's like, it never occurred to me as like a biracial Asian woman that I could be a part of woman of color community. And I was like, oh, it never occurred to me that I could not be a part of women of color community. And I was like, wave. <laughs> and I had like launched it and all of a sudden it was like, I think people were trying to speak encouragement, but it was like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> And I had to dig deeper with Jesus. Do you know what? I was like, dig deeper with Jesus. I had like stepped out of the boat and then I was like, I didn't know it would be like this. But Jesus has met me in that. Jesus has met me in that. And so I just wanted to, I felt like the Lord was like, share the way you're experiencing this right now. So that is literally my right now thing. Praise God. I had more women apply for the cohort than we had room for. Wow. And we just extended invitation. Yeah, it's so awesome. It's so exciting. It's so good. And in March, we're going to launch with 11 women who are all in leadership all over the country. We're going to create that sacred space. Amen. Amen. I'm so excited. So, that is my testimony. If you, if you are experiencing this storm, I hope that my testimony will encourage you that even though it's taking you places you don't want to go and making you face things you don't want to face, that Jesus will reveal more of himself to you in the midst of that and will come through for you in ways. But maybe you're in this storm and you know you're supposed to get out of the boat in some way. And you keep looking back at like, but what about when getting out of the boat just meant getting on shore and following you around? Like I didn't know it was gonna be get out the boat and walk on water. But what was faithful then is not what is faithful now. And we need to keep letting God transform us. And if you are scared, then you just need to reach out. You just need to reach out. You just need to call out, help me, Jesus. And he does. He, he puts his hand out, and he'll grab you and hold you. You're not going to drown. But you got to keep in conversation with Jesus. Keep in conversation with Jesus. Amen? So I, this is, I'm glad in the end that I didn't, like, make Brother Wayne tag in for me. <laughs> And I'm glad in the end that I didn't just do an old term because I feel like this is an invitation for us as a church right now. That we're not, a lot of us are not at first time we're leaving the boat. But a lot of us are at second and third time being back at the boat. And, and we're wistful and nostalgic for the first time. But, but we need to trust that there is more of a revelation for us and more of a transformation for us. And so let's not be nostalgic for over here. Let's keep pressing into right here. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Can we sing, you know, uh, you did it the other day, the Ocean's Bridge, the Spirit Take Me?